an external um, using external program and let me start doing uh, um, let me start uh, with the talk so last time uh, last time so this is talk number two last time um, Mm. Last. Sorry. Talk two. Last time we discussed Morse functions, and I recall you Morse a Morse function is such that if f goes from m to r, a manifold to r, and z is such that df of z is 0 then d square f of z is invertible or non-degenerate has uh, non-zero uh, has non-zero determinant um, uh, during the classes we uh, said that this uh, this is a matrix and the matrix is uh, mm, Mm, this matrix is uh, in local coordinates and we said uh, we proved during the classes that this is non-degenerate and then we introduced gradient so let me briefly recall I have M I choose G and G is a Riemannian metric that is a choice of a scalar product in TXM for each X so choice then we have TF goes to TX of X goes to TXM to R so DF of X belongs to hmm? TXM and this is gradient. TF of X goes to the gradient. And during the classes we will see that you will see that the standard definition of gradient that you are used to from like I would say uh, calculus is uh, really this definition and we see it using uh, sort of factoriality of the gradient. So gradient is uh, factorial only under isometries. This is like one of the problems during uh, that we will discuss during classes. Uh, okay, so far so good. Now let me just uh, uh, how does gradient f look like near a critical point? So let's see be a critical point. Then by Morse lemma, so z is such that df of z is 0, Morse lemma, f of x1, xn, so by Morse lemma there exist local coordinates near, uh, near z, such that this is equal to f of z, z minus x1 square minus minus x k square plus x k plus one square plus x n square and this k is the index all right so that's what we get and now of course uh, we would like to compute the gradient but we don't know about these coordinates so first and that's like the most natural thing to ask Assume D X one X N R orthonormal. And by this I assume that the, the matrix is standard in these coordinates. If you prefer a more uh, more concrete then you just say that D X one D X N form 
an orthonormal basis of Txm. So this exists locally. So we can assume for a moment that this matrix has this property. So how do you proceed? Normally you take, you have a Morse function and then you adjust the gradient vector field for this function. Uh, so that's the uh, uh, that's the way uh, uh, you work. And then if this is an orthonormal, then you just from this formula you get a standard form um, that the gradient vector field is equal to two minus x one minus x two minus x k x k plus one x n. Okay. This is uh, the most annoying tool in Morse theory. So uh, you can start counting whether I forget about this tool an even number of times or odd number of times, but definitely I will. Uh, you've been warned. Mm, it doesn't affect anything, it's just speeding up the, the vector field or slowing it down. So, uh, if we have a situation like this, we have a lot of... Uh, let me just copy this. To the next page. I will soon upload it, but so we have this formula. So how does this the face portrait uh, looks like uh, near the critical point? So a face portrait of a, an ordinary differential equation is the is a picture containing uh, trajectories of the vector field. So solutions to gamma dot of t equal tf of gamma t. So these are trajectories of the vector field. And uh, you study the, you draw trajectories to get a, um, uh, an idea of how does the flow of the graded vector field looks like. So more theory is mostly about flows of uh, of uh, of the gradient vector field, and then I will slightly generalize this notion. So, what is the local form? Well, let me just fix z to be the center, and this is like a many multi-dimensional picture. But you assume that these coordinates are x one up to x k and xk plus 1 xn so these are like different uh, different uh, different coordinates and what's happening to the flow so suppose we are at the line where xk plus 1 up to x xn are 0 so suppose this and then then what happens if you follow this trajectory, well, this equation is uh, actually uh, linear, so you can solve it by assuming that gamma is equal gamma 1, gamma n, and then gamma s dot is equal to minus 2 gamma s, uh, or plus minus and plus for s greater than k minus for s less than k so this is a differential equation that you are able to solve uh, if you know uh, martin is talking but i can't hear him uh, Wait a second. Uh, 
uh, uh, okay mm. just trying to check but I can't uh, oh yes so meanwhile I would, like, I would like to ask the question yeah How did we actually use the orthogonality well you have to pass from you have to compute the gradient and the gradient requires a metric okay so normally if you are local in local coordinates you can say that this is uh, uh, equal to 2x1 minus 2x1 minus 2xk 2xk plus 1 2xn but these are coordinates this is an object in the cotangent space like in the dual space space of functionals you have to pass from the space of functionals to the space of uh, to the space of vectors. That's that's a, that. This is a subtlety. You need uh, you need to have uh, local core. You have you need to have a metric to pass from the dual space or to identify the space of functionals with the space of vectors, and that's why we need to have orthogonality, because you can choose another metric. And then your gradient vector field will be different. Okay, and if if we have orthogonality, then the isomorphism is just would be just a trans, uh, transposition. Yes, it's the transposition. It's the, transposition means passing to the dual. It's usually okay. it's it's a usual concept in in in, mm -hmm. mathem in mathematics. The transposition is a hidden pass to the dual, and. Okay. Uh, and transposition is p is passing to the dual if you're working. If the metric that is behind this this passing to the dual is orthogonal in the coordinates you work. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why if you change the basis uh, of uh, mm, of a matrix, you ma you you use congruence. But if you change the basis of the form, you use uh, you use. Uh, uh, how it's called, uh, you use conjugates. Or the other way around, I always switch this, uh, these two notions. But this one is with inverse, one is transposition, and then that's... But this uh, wait, what is the, because the, isom the isomorphism between the, the tangent and cotangent space uh, works for any Riemannian metric. Yes. And not only for an orthogonal metric. Yes, so we assume that it's, or that, uh, well, for a metric is not orthogonal. Orthogonal is a local coordinate system. We assume that this is a local coordinate that this local coordinate system is orthogonal because we want to we we, we want the computations to be simple, as simple as possible. Okay, so we I, I mean, I mean, what, what would happen if the basis were, were not orthogonal? Because I still can see it. Mm. I mean, I see that it's that we can just transpose, but why can we transpose? Uh, what What's the problem with transposing if the basis were not orthogonal? If the basis is not orthogonal, then you can transpose, but it's different... Uh, well, okay, uh, the gradient would have different shape. It would be defined, but it uh, would have uh, different shape. But this formula wouldn't work, wouldn't be true, because if it's... Suppose like that the length of x1 is equal to five, so this so the the length of dx one d, d over dx one is equal to five. Then in here, you will have either one fifth or five. I don't. You just need to compute it. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Okay, but we chose orthogonality because we want the and un, to understand the 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 situation and actually in the in most of the applications we will assume that this core this morse coordinates are orthogonal so that we choose an appropriate metric after uh, after pass after using morse lemma and uh, you see if it's simple then mm, mm, if the coordinates are simple then like trying to study trajectories of the vector field so solutions to these ordinary differential equations this splits into a n tuple of uh, linear ODEs in one variable which you can easily solve by saying that gamma s of t is gamma s of 0 e to plus or minus t 
to T. Okay, that's you just uh, just write a solution. But instead of writing a solution, let's understand what happens. So if we are on this line, that that means these coordinates uh, are zero. Then all the differentials, all the differentials are attracting are uh, are negative, are positive in here and negative in here. So the flow is attracted along these lines. Conversely, if we are on this space, on this line or this uh, hypersurface, then the coordinates these are expanding, so the flow expands in these directions. But there is no contractions because these coordinates are vanished, and these are like invariant subspaces. So this is and of course if you are somewhere here, then the trajectory looks like this. So this is a multidimensional picture of something that is called a saddle point. So this is the way the trajectory looks like for near the uh, near the uh, uh, near the mm, near a critical point and we will come back to this uh, mm, to this uh, mm, picture in a few moments. Uh, uh, mm, because we want to have uh, well if you can prove that it will look similarly if you are using different gradient if you use different uh, if you use different gradient because choosing different uh, uh, choosing different uh, because the uh, the gradient vector field in different matrix will have uh, as will have non non trivial linearization in uh, near local coordinates and you can always use uh, uh, hadamar perron theorem about uh, conjugating with uh, with this kind of flow however mm, hadamar perron theorem gives you only mm, only c0 conjugate here, if you have a Morse, if your Morse function is smooth, if you choose a, an appropriate metric, then your mm, uh, your uh, you're done because you have all the shape, all the picture of the the whole picture of the of the gradient vector field is uh, preserved without uh, without uh, referring to some very difficult theorems in ordinary differential equations. Okay, so. The choice of the metric is like for is very handy for for us, but it's also very mm, uh, because we just write down the gradient. But it's also very uh, it also uh, allows us to avoid a lot of mm, uh, a lot of complications. Okay, so we leave the. Mm, Mm. we leave the singular point for a moment and uh, we will prove now the first the or second theorem uh, which I usually call theorem about nothing and the theorem about nothing can be phrased in a different way my favorite way is if nothing happens then nothing happens and more seriously so this is like the the concept that is behind and now there is a more serious Statement suppose MR is uh, a Morse function 
and a b in r are such that f has no critical points in f inverse a b okay which means that nothing happens which means that there are no critical points between uh, like in the picture that we had for example a and b then item a f inverse of a is uh, is diffeomorphic to f inverse of b b f inverse of minus infinity a minus infinity b okay now the theorem seems obvious when you see this picture then you see well the level set are level sets are the same but I will give you a proof, and the proof is uh, the proof is more important than the theorem because the theorem you will you will think about it that if nothing happens, then nothing happens, and you will mostly ignore this theorem throughout uh, uh, your uh, journey through more theory. But the proof actually is more uh, is more complex. Let me just uh, uh, didn't it just over override it. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's next page of that. I try to f uh, to create a new folder, a new folder, but uh, a new new nodes uh, like my three attempts uh, of passing to landscape uh, failed. So I decided to use the uh, the old lectures instead of the new lectures. But it's if you scroll down, then there are previous scroll back. There are previous. Uh, there's a previous lecture. In the slides. Thanks for asking. Okay, so the proof. And the proof is actually the a very typical proof in Morse theory. If you understand this proof, then you understand like 50% of Morse, Morse theory, or maybe 30, uh, or maybe 10. Uh, so choose a metric. M. And when I say metric means Riemannian metric and don't get uh, confused by some uh, general topology statements that there are some other metrics than Riemannian metrics. There are no metrics uh, like this in this talk. So we have F inverse of A, F inverse of B, and consider gradient vector field F. Okay, so how does the gradient vector field... Okay, one more thing. Uh, in many books, people consider minus gradient so that the flow of the function goes downwards like water on a uh, on a on a hill it goes downwards but uh, well this gives you more intuition but it gives you one more minus sign to control so i'm using the standard uh, i'm using the standard uh, gradient vector field it's a bit counterintuitive because the flow goes up but who cares you have if you have one uh, more, if you have one less minus sign to take care of, <coughs> it's better for you. Okay, so what is the what is the idea? The idea is that you start with at this point, and uh, you look at the trajectory. Let me call this point x0. Gamma, that is the solution of, uh, if you're not familiar with dot, then x dot is equal d over dtx. That's a standard notation for, uh, that we're going to use. And dot gamma, of t is equal to the gradient f of gamma of t. So we go along the gradient vector field. Okay? Now we 
claim that we are going to reach that at some finite time we are going to reach this uh, the top okay so how can you prove that we're going to reach the top we will prove that we go all the time we go uh, we go upwards with a non-zero speed so now we use gamma of t So how shall I, shall I proceed? Uh, I will choose one more. Choose c greater than zero, such that the norm of gradient of c x is greater than c for all x in f inverse of. A, B. And I'm, all, I'm always allowed to choose this C because I assume that there are no critical points of F in this region. So my M is compact, so that's I, what I always assume here. If I don't assume that it's F, M is compact, then it's uh, not... Uh, mm, then I will tell you. So M is compact. So a closed subset is a compact subset. A function that is uh, that doesn't attain zeros, and this function doesn't attain zeros because we don't have a critical point, is bounded from below by a positive constant on on this space. So you can always choose it. And now look at this expression. What is this? This is the, you have this solution, so gamma satisfies this, and this is the speed of the, the speed of change of f along the trajectory gamma. So we go up, and this is like, this tells you how high we are. Gamma climbs up f, and f, and this is, this tells you, this gives you the, the current, the current height. So this is the change of the speed of the of current height. So this is equal to by the chain rule df evaluated on gamma dot of t. But this is the same. Now we are using the gradient, like gamma f gamma of t. But now we use this. So this is equal to radiant f gamma of t square. Now we use this. This is greater than c square, which means after time b minus r over c square the trajectory will have reached the level set F inverse of P. Okay, so that means that we, when we start, we reach the top in finite time. This uh, is uh, like one thing that I would like to emphasize probably the most that why do we bother about finite time well there is a statement that uh, about I will pass to the next slide in a moment uh, just just to slow down I will explain to you mm -hmm. there is this there is a concept of uh, local of uh, local dependence of uh, the Mm. Uh, of the solution of the ODE on initial conditions. And this statement tells you that if you have like two critical, two, two starting points that are close to each other, then after finite time they are still close. So actually it is, you fix the time and you say uh, for a given time t, I can choose the 
or maybe I will pass it to uh, to write it down. I will use different color because it's like a side remark, but it's important to be written down. Local dependence. We have like a differential equations of this type, and for any t. Uh, or I would say, mm, I will finish this. Uh, there exists, uh, and epsilon greater than zero, and choose x dot of zero equals x zero for any t. There exists delta such that if x1 minus x0 less than delta then mm, x of t minus x tilde of t is less than epsilon for t less than for t in 0 t uh, sorry uh, and uh, x tilde solves x tilde of 0 is x1. So what I wrote here is that for any uh, for any finite time and find any epsilon you can always find delta so that if you start with your new equation uh, sufficiently close then you stay close for, for the finite time. But this is finite time ag argument. If the time is infinite, then it's not true. For example, if you are in this picture, if you start here or here, then in the infinite time you will either go here or here. So if you want to control the behavior of nearby points, you always need to... Mm, uh, always need to... Mm, uh, you always uh, mm, uh, you always need to control the time. If you don't control the time, then uh, then you don't have continuous or smooth dependence on initial conditions because of the unstability questions. So this is like a subtle uh, subtle but important thing that we have a bounded time. So this after this side remark. <clears throat> by theorem on local dependence on initial condition the map mm. Uh, the map x0 goes to x1 which is which takes uh, and this map that takes that takes x0 to the point x1 at which the trajectory through x0 is mm, hits f inverse of p is a smooth map. Okay? So here is x0 we have here x0 and here we have x1 so this is the map and this is a smooth map this is of course a bijection because uh, well this is a smooth map this is uh, an 
uh, one to one with its image because uh, the trajectories don't cross and don't glue by the uniqueness and by the uniqueness theorem. On the other hand, there is uh, there is an inverse map which takes the trajectory uh, you by using minus the gradient vector field. So this is like th these maps are inverse, and. Uh, For this, I will advise you, I will strongly advise you to fill in the details by yourself, by using your favorite, uh, your fav favorite statement. So those f of you that uh, attended uh, my course on ODE East, it's uh, it's sometimes taught on the ODE's course, but not always. Mm. If not, you have to find your own formulation of the local dependence condition and probably you need to use the implicit function theorem. But this is like a standard, a standard part. And the second non, the second standard part is that you can also define <clears throat> we can construct the diffeomorphism diffeomorphism of f inverse of a b and f inverse of a cross 0 1 how do we do this i will do that and i will also wave hands to claim that it's a diffeomorphism but it will be so mm, mm, We have f inverse of a, f inverse of b, and we have a point x in here. So where does it go? Take the flow mm, mm, gamma dot of t equal gradient f of gamma gamma of zero is x. I call it the flow through x. And what I know? I know that this hits uh, an element x0 here, and x1 in here. And moreover, I can define the time of reaching x1 and time of reaching x0 <coughs> by in such a way that mm, gamma of t0 is equal x0 so t0 is less than 0 gamma or less or equal gamma of t1 is equal to x1 t1 is greater than 0 so my diffeomorphism phi, so this will be the diffeomorphism, my diffeomorphism phi takes uh, x to x0 and now we choose uh, minus t0 over t1 minus t0. So this belongs to f inverse of a and this belongs to mm, belongs to mm, this is any this is belongs to the interval 0 1 because uh, t t0 is somewhere between uh, t, t, t0 is negative okay so this is like minus t0 t1 so again I can prove that 
this is a diffeomorphism. Of course, this diffeomorphism de depends on the uh, uh, depends on the choice of the gradient. So it depends on the choice of the metric. And actually, it's not a it's not a, a bug; it's a feature. We will use this concept and try to use this concept for uh, by uh, when we will discuss the more small condition later on. For the moment, this dif this choice of diffeomorphism is well. It's not canonical. It's not natural. It's it's obvious in the the formal sense. It's like obvious uh, once you've chosen the gradient. So we prove, and by saying we prove means uh, try to figure out by yourself. This is a standard exercise on ODEs, and we will do that during the classes if you want. Uh, so now there is this uh, proof of the second part of the theorem mm. uh, so the second part was about the diffeomorphism between f inverse of minus infinity a being f inverse of minus infinity b so observe and we will use a trick. Observe that f has only finitely many critical points. So this is a question why? And if you ask yourself why it has finitely many, well the answer is because it's compact and because we can use the uh, more lemma. For example, uh, we have a function mm, uh, m, uh, we have a manifold m, we choose at each point we choose a neighborhood where the local, where the Morse lemma holds at each critical point. So we take a ball in local coordinates, take a smaller ball, so the big balls, the big open balls, big open balls and complements of small closed balls and the compl the complement of the small bo closed balls gives you a cover of m and it's a finite cover and you pass to a fi sub cover but it's it has to be a finite sub cover so it's uh, mm, mm, so there there is finitely many critical points like a standard pretty standard argument once you have because you have local control of the of the critical point they cannot accumulate by more lemma so f has only finitely many critical points and so mm, mm, the set of critical values Is finite. Well, that's no choice not to be finite. In particular, closed. We have the interval AB that is disjoint from the set of critical values. So actually we can like make it a bit thicker always. It's also disjoint. Okay. So now what we do? We have f inverse of a minus epsilon, f inverse of a, 
f inverse of p. We have f inverse of a minus epsilon a is diffeomorphic to f inverse of a minus epsilon sorry uh, f minus epsilon cross a f inverse of a b is diffeomorphic of a a b and f inverse of a minus epsilon b Okay, that's uh, what we have on the on that page. This diffeomorphism, and I didn't tell you, but you can realize that the top goes to f inverse of a one. So this diffeomorphism is actually mm, compatible with the first diffeomorphism. Okay, so now how do I prove that this guy? Is diffeomorphic to that guy. Well, I write f inverse of uh, minus infinity a is equal to f inverse of minus infinity a minus epsilon union a minus epsilon a cross. Uh, sorry, the first f inverse of a minus a cross a minus epsilon a f inverse of minus infinity b b. So these two, so these guys are diffeomorphic because uh, well this interval and this interval the one can be shrunk to the other and the gluing is the gluing is the same so this gives you the diffeomorphism and this proves the more or less proves the theorem about nothing happens if nothing happens then nothing happens shouldn't we somehow control derivative in this last diffeomorphism because we, we want on the first part, which is uh, the same the same in both, we, we can use identity. And on the second, we don't have identity. So to, to, uh, this diffeomorphism has to agree. Uh, you mean that uh, this diffeomorphism? No, uh, the whole diffeomorphism between f, f uh, inverse uh, minus infinity a and uh, F uh, inverse minus infinity B. We, have, we want to have diffeomorphism between those. And we have diffeomorphism, diffeomorphisms on two parts of union. Yeah, but we we would like to control somehow that it glues to one diffeomorphism. Okay, okay. So let me just give you a more uh, detailed approach, if you want. So this is like again using the. So x belongs to f inverse of uh, a b. All right. So what I do? I choose a trajectory. Define it T0, T1, and T2. Uh, sorry, let me just write it this way. T1 and here T2. And then I I would like to choose uh, to map X, and this is X0. Or maybe I don't even need x0, so I want to map x, uh, so 
so gamma dot of 0 equal x gamma dot of t is minus gradient let me just think x will go to gamma of hmm, t0 plus minus t1 uh, uh, <coughs> Or maybe maybe we we'll try we will shift the time. Okay, so f the formula will be more transparent if I assume that uh, the trajectory uh, the trajectory goes uh, this way. Uh, uh, we have x in here, but this is x zero and gamma. And we have like 0, t1, t2, t3. Okay? So I, I change, I, I shift the time so that we get it. And then I map x to go to gamma of t2 times t1 over t3. So if I am in here, like in halfway from this point to point to this point, then I will be mapped to halfway from this point to this point. So this is like partially okay, but uh, there is some small adjustment that I want to make. And the small adjustment, if you want me to, I can give you this adjustment, is like... Mm, mm, instead of a function t2 goes to t2 plus t1 over t3 we should better use something like A function that is uh, mm, mm, that takes uh, phi of t two and phi maps uh, zero t three to zero t one and phi like uh, an increasing function of phi is. Mm, an identity near zero. Okay, so we choose once and so this is like a technical step, but uh, maybe it's uh, worth giving it. Uh, this is like the moral formula. The moral formula is like we shift a point, we move it from here to here, like proportionally by the propor rescaling it on the t along the trajectory. Uh, that's a moral formula, but again we hit the same problem that Piotr uh, noted a few minutes ago, namely that this is not smooth. This is not smooth near near that point here. So this is, of course, a legitimate diffeomorphism between this part and that part, but it doesn't need to extend to a diffeomorphism between the whole piece to whole piece because of non possible non-smoothness issues at this level set. Okay? So that's to avoid this we play a simple trick and this simple trick is not using this diffeomorphism but using this rescaling but using a uh, like gentle rescaling that we rescale not using a function a naive linear function but we use a function that is identity near 
uh, near the origin and it goes it rescales the segment 0 t3 to 0 t1 and then when we plug in this in into here then all of the sudden my diffeomorphism will become smooth will become the identity in some neighborhood of the of this line so then it will be okay so does it answer your question yeah of course okay so this is like a and this trick you should remember this uh, i uh, normally i try to avoid answering detailed technical questions but this is actually the the trick that appears uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that appears uh, a lot of time uh, so uh, now let me pass to one explanation and one like rather important concept of uh, more theory before we pass to uh, the second statement along the along the line of if nothing happens then nothing happens then the second statement will be if something happens then something happens but before we pass to it uh, we need to introduce one more concept and I will mm, uh, I try to personally I try to avoid this concept for quite a long time but uh, eventually I decided to to learn it and it became quite useful so let me just uh, give you a motivating example let's say we have like a, a function f over r2 to r like say f of x y is equal to x square y minus 3x or whatever else and you have the gradient f equal 2xy minus 3x square so that's a standard computation from mm, mm, from calculus and then you want to perturb the gradient. Like choose like a local, small local perturbation of the gradient factor. And then it's really hard to perturb gradient if uh, uh, if uh, mm, if you if you work with the vector field. So if you want to perturb the gradient, uh, then it won't be a gradient usually so what is the a vector field over uh, a vector field on r2 is with with uh, is a gradient with orthogonal orthonormal coordinates and v is Q if and only if well what uh, what is your preferred way of writing it uh, dp over dy is equal dq over dx okay because this will be the there this is the mixed derivative of mixed second derivatives of f have to um, have to agree so when I teach Calculus. I always say that the theorem about that the mixed th mixed derivatives agree is the most the deepest theorem that you learn on calculus. It's uh, mm, it's definitely the most uh, the fundament the, the fundament of most of the differential geometry and uh, like half of uh, uh, homological algebra and algebraic topology relies on the fact that the mixed derivatives of the uh, mm, uh, like theory for, of manifolds of homological algebra of manifolds it's like most important thing is that the, the mixed derivatives agree so it's a gradient so if you want to perturb it you need to perturb it here but you need to perturb it here and look if you want to perturb it slightly by some like adding uh, adding a local perturbation like 2xy minus 3x squared plus phi times uh, some alpha beta where where phi is uh, a bump function so it's a function that is 
like concentrated in, uh, in some small neighborhood, like you want to use local perturbation, then you can, this thing, not only this gets out of hand, but also the, <coughs> also the vector, also the function, if you perturb it, it can become a gradient of a function, but this function can, can be much different than the original function. You perturb it somewhere, but the gradient changes and then the function is, uh, the function is uh, uh, changed everywhere. And this is a, a phenomenon that you might want to avoid. So what do you do instead? So this is a motivating example, I slide. You ask maybe the definition of the gradient vector field is too rigid. Well, it is. Or maybe you, can, you want to like, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. perturb a vector field and the metric along and this is like perturbing two things instead of one is very bad but you can introduce a concept uh, i first learned it in the book of milner probably it's milner's concept so one of the ingenious concept is the concept of the gradient like vector field definition let f m to r be a morse function a gradient like vector field v for f so it's not a gradient is a vector field on m such that one at each critical point z there are local coordinates x1 xn such that well these are morse coordinates f of x1 xn is equal f of z plus minus x1 square minus xk square plus xk plus 1 square plus x square v of x1 xn is equal to minus x1 minus xk xk plus 1 xn okay so these are not fixed coordinates but in some coordinates you have these two thing like tf of v is greater or equal zero three tf of v of z is equal zero if and only if v mm, uh, if of and only if Z is a critical point of F. So let me phrase what is this condition. If you uh, if you're still at the at the level of thinking about the gradients, then this can be rephrased as gradient F scalar product is greater or equal to zero, which means that the function F increases along the trajectories of v or non decreases and this tells you that it non -de doesn't decrease but this tells you that it decreases and uh, mm, that it uh, it stops at hmm, uh, uh, it stops uh, it, sorry that it uh, really increases unless you are at the critical point so first of all And this uh, inequality is for all the independent space. Yes, this... Uh, no, 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 no. What is this? This is a gradient vector field V. Yes? So this is... D uh, F V is any arbitrary vector from the, from the tangent space. No. Or no. No, 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 no. Let me just phrase it. Uh, v is a vector field that we define. V is a vector field, yes. So V is here. 
So V goes to X to TX of M. Okay? So here we just write it in coordinates. TV F of Z. V of Z is greater zero for all Z. Okay? Is it better mm -hmm. now? Okay, so yeah. ve a vector field, uh, for those of you that may might not have seen this, a vector field is a choice of a vector in each tangent space of the manifold. And uh, of course, that's usually required that is a smooth choice of a vector. Okay, so far so good. Uh, mm, and there is a very important remark, so remark. A gradient vector field if the metric is appropriate near each a critical point. So if the metric is appropriate, I mean the coordinates are orthonormal, the Morse coordinates, some Morse coordinates are, uh, are orthonormal, then uh, a gradient vector field is, uh, is a gradient-like vector field. Is a gradient-like. So there are, uh, so gradient-like vector fields really exist. Uh, this, uh, this concept is much uh, less rigid. So, for example, if you have a vector field, uh, uh, if you have a uh, if we have a gradient-like vector field, so and we have a if we are uh, like at some point where which is not a critical point, so we choose, uh, maybe I use different color. Uh, if we are at the point, near a point which is not a critical point, then I can, I can always slightly perturb this vector field and it becomes the gradient vector field, gradient-like vector field again. Because, well, let me call this U. So, if Z is not a critical point, then uh, TF of V of Z is greater than zero. So TF of V of Z is greater than C in U, so I choose, if I choose a small vector, uh, so if uh, uh, if in a vect in a neighborhood of Z it's still non-zero and it's still, and if, since the closure of U is compact, because I choose small neighborhood and its closure is compact, then I can always say that it's greater than C. And uh, <coughs> uh, and so nearby vector fields so, for example, if I choose a new vector field V prime such that in some norm it's uh, less than C half, then DF of V of Z, V prime of Z is greater than C half in U. So, I can, if I have a vector field that I can uh, and then I can per a gradient vector field. I can perturb. I can always perturb it near uh, in near a non-critical point. That's a fantastic property, and we will be using this property all all the time. And this perturbation preserves the, the property that uh, pr all the properties that we want. And of course, the whole proof of the theorem, like from here. It actually goes through if we replace the vector for the gradient vector field by the gradient like vector field. We start to choose a gradient like vector field, and the only thing is that we uh, 
need to replace this argument by something a slightly but just a tiny little bit more sophisticated than what we used. So instead of this we should write like df of v is greater than c or whatever. I will I will leave it to you. And there is a actually a concept uh, actually a theorem or maybe it's which is quite worth recording theorem for any gradient like vector field V on M there exists a metric G on M not uniquely defined such that V is the gradient. Okay. Uh, the proof, uh, I will not give you the proof. The proof is really technical. Uh, I leave it as an exercise. Proof. Exercise. And if you have problems with uh, solving it, look at the paper of of uh, Morse theory for manifolds with boundary. So I remember writing down this proof, so it's uh, so it's there. But uh, I remember looking for the proof in many books, and I couldn't find it. So it's like a small, sm si simple statement. Once you know how to do it, uh, basically. Mm, basically, the idea is to mm, define this metric locally. So, take a point. Uh, you can always uh, use rectification lemma for from ODEs that uh, a, a vector field, a non critical near near a non critical vector field, you can always assume that in some coordinates the vector field is like parallel, like first coordinate. And so you can define the define the metric uh, locally near each point, each mean each non non critical point, near each critical point you define it by this condition that x one x n are orthonormal, and then you patch the matrix uh, the the patch you patch the matrix uh, the uh, the matrix uh, using uh, partition of unity. Okay. So far, so good. I was planning to tell you about something uh, about uh, a statement, uh, but maybe I will just uh, uh, okay. Here's a good moment to state a theorem, but I will prove it later. I will prove it next week. Uh, so there is a theorem which goes even further that if you have an appropriate gradient vector field gradient like vector field then you can uh, all the, you can even find a function and not just a vector field so theorem mm. uh, suppose v is a vector field such that one for a uh, vector field on M such that for any there are finitely many points Z such that vz equals to mm, zero at each such point or near each such point 
the uh, there are local coordinates x1 up to xn such that v of x1 xn is the annoying 2 minus x1 minus xk and k of course depends on z k is allowed to change with uh, with the critical point uh, up to xn so that's the second uh, second statement which means that it's, it's local there is a statement that there's a third statement if uh, gamma of t is a trajectory of <coughs> mm, v then limit of t goes to minus infinity gamma of t limit t to plus infinity gamma of t exist and they are critical points and four the four is the most technical statement there are no broken trajectories broken sorry broken circular trajectories trajectories and by this I mean uh, let me just uh, stop okay i resume recording so what is the second the third condition is like you have a uh, the condition number three tells you that there are uh, that each trajectory goes from one critical point to another and you don't you want to avoid the situation that you go from one critical point to, to this one using one trajectory, then there is a trajectory from this point to another point. And then there is a trajectory from this point to another point, and then there is a trajectory back to the first one. This is a circular trajectory. This is a, a set of trajectories that go connect two critical points, then another, 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 and they they loop. This can't happen this can't happen for the for the gradient vector field because the uh, because the gradient vector field the function is increasing so the value of f at this point is smaller than the value of f at that point and it is smaller at the value of f at this point and smaller at the value of f at that point so this is the and then the statement then there exists a function f from M to R such that V is a gradient like a vector field. Okay? So this is uh, this is called vector field integration lemma. Okay, so uh, exercise go to paper embedded Morse theory by Powell and find the mistake in the proof. So we wrote the proof of this theorem and uh, the proof was incorrect. I next, probably next week or in two weeks, I will give you a proof of that, a corrected proof of that theorem. It's, uh, it's, it really builds up on the concept that I told you today. So, yeah. Mm. This uh, well, this is not the most important proof in the history of uh, Morse theory, but uh, in a sense, this the, the proof of the theorem 
teaches you how to think about Morse theory, not just uh, the most important results that you can find and the proof and the mistake that we committed here. The, pipe, the paper is, uh, has been published four years ago. Uh, uh, is really really subtle, so it's uh, it's really hard to find it. Uh, mm, so this is, uh, and we will be using this theorem uh, when we pro will prove cancellation lemma of Milner. So Milner, in a sense, in his proof of uh, cancel can cancellation lemma of critical points, uses this uh, uses a well. It's not the same statement, but it's. Mm. Uh, it's uh, you can uh, he, if he needed he would have written down the correct proof of that statement but he didn't need uh, ok let me come back I, I won't give you the proof today I will give you it uh, next week because we need to spend a few more moments understanding the local behavior near a uh, uh, near a critical point and introduce a new concept. Well, a concept that is might be new to some of you. We have a vector field xn equals 2 minus x1 minus xk xk plus 1 xn. Okay, and I drew the face portrait of that guy. So x1 x k x k plus one x n these are the coordinates so we have contractions in uh, in these directions and expansion in this direction and so here, here it looks like this so let me give you a general definition definition for but uh, Keep this in mind. So the definition is more general and more complex than this. For a critical point C, the stable set V S of C is the set of all points x in M such that if gamma dot of t is equal v of gamma and gamma of 0 is x then the limit gamma of mm, t is equal to z. Okay, so this is the set where that contains all points such that the trajectory from this point hits the hits z in the in, in infinite time. Of course, z is a is a critical or stationary po stationary point of of uh, mm, of v. So it can't hit it before the infinite time, but it will reach it in infinite time in the future. And the unstable set is the same, but with the limit of t to minus infinity gamma of t is equal to z. So the unstable set is here. And this is the Vs and this is gonna be sorry Ws and this is gonna be Wu. Why I'm saying stable set? Well, remark and the remark I think I can write it here. If uh, z is non-degenerate. So, and uh, d square, sorry, d and hyperbolic, hyperbolic, 
by which means that T T V has no critical values mm. with vanishing uh, sorry no no eigenvalues with uh, vanishing real part then this is like uh, Grobman Hartman W S of Z W U of Z are manifolds which is quite nice and they are called stable manifolds and unstable manifolds unstable manifold and uh, when we pass to uh, what well, at some moment we will pass to embedded Morse theory or maybe even immersed Morse theory and then this uh, uh, this will no longer be this will no longer hold and then uh, this will not be actual manifold so we will not be able to use German Hartman theorem but then there is the but then in the that's why I started with saying that stable set and unstable set mm -hmm. uh, instead of uh, writing uh, like uh, writing immediately that it's a stable or unstable manifold so this is the stable and unstable set and then there is one important thing we have uh, for gradient vector fields or gradient oh this should be the marker not the, this should be the pointer note for gradient vector field every in local coordinates everything is known so we know what is the stable set and we know what is the unstable set because the stable manifold stable xk plus 1 equals equals xk uh, equals xn equals 0 and the unstable x1 equals equals xk equals 0 so these are like in local coordinates these manifolds are in fact hyperplanes uh, so this is uh, the moment I will leave you with